Howdy! Welcome to the Rhinestone Roper Show. Today we're going to be talking about the physics of trick roping. Many times people will come to a show. My daughter and wife trick rope and I trick rope and after the show people will come up and they'll approach the women actually. They'll approach my wife and daughter and sometimes they'll say I have a lot of experience with trick roping and my rope won't do that. And they'll say, every time you come out here, your rope does exactly the same thing. That's not natural. My rope won't do that. How come my rope doesn't do that? There's a lot of reasons our rope might not do that. <clears throat> maybe they didn't have me train them like I trained my wife or daughter. Or maybe they didn't put into practice. Or maybe they don't understand the physics of trick roping. And consequently, the rope isn't set up correctly. And by setup, I'm mainly talking about the Honda. What we're talking about are the laws of physics, namely centripetal force with a P, centripetal force, which means center seeking, and centrifugal force, or centrifugal force, center fleeing force. And we're talking about inertia, a, uh, the property where uh, an object traveling through space a certain direction speed will just keep going that direction speed unless acted upon uh, by an external force. Let's say a cat is traveling through space and you see it coming, you got a bucket in your hand. As that cat comes, you, you reach out and catch that cat in the bucket and you just keep going and you start swinging that old cat. Now the cat will stay against the bottom of the bucket. <laughs> The force acting upon the cat is centrifugal force, center fleeing force. Actually, center, centrifugal force is really imaginary. It doesn't really exist. It only exists in the context of rotating systems. And we're trick ropers. We're all about rotating systems. So for us, centrifugal force exists. But you catch that cat and you're swinging like that. And that cat just stays in the bucket. Even though the bucket's upside down here, that cat is pressed against the bottom of the bucket. So center fleeing force is acting on that cat. And what that cat feels, even more than the centrifugal force, he feels the bottom of that bucket holding him back. Now that, uh, that force is centripetal force or center, center seeking force. Your bucket is the center seeking force that always changes that direction of the cat. The cat wants to go straight. Inertia, he just wants to keep going. But the bottom of that bucket keeps pulling him towards the center and keeps, and keeps changing his direction. The classic example of the relationship between centripetal and centrifugal forces are the, the rubber ball tied on a string, swinging in a circle. But I don't have a rubber ball on a string and uh, and the cats around here, you can't catch them. Maybe they've been swung in a bucket too many times. What I do have is a horseshoe with a string on it. This feels kind of dangerous, swinging a horseshoe on a string. <laughs> now center fleeing force, centrifugal force, is acting on that horseshoe, keeping it in orbit around my finger. Here, the centripetal force is the tension on the string. If any time, if my knot came undone, the horseshoe would just, would just keep flying to go through that window right there. Now, in order to uh, increase the centrifugal force, there's a couple ways to do it. You can increase the speed. Increasing the speed increases the centrifugal force. Also, increasing the mass increases the centrifugal force. So if I tied two horseshoes on here and swung it, my finger would feel the difference. My finger feels the difference swinging this thing faster. There's a lot of increased force. All these forces act on our trick ropes. As you can see here, we got this carpet made with our logo on it. This is me, my horse Lucky Joe, and this is a loop I'm spinning around him. Centrifugal force is acting on every piece of this rope, keeping it expanded out in a circle. Here's the Honda that you can't see. This rope passes through the Honda, and this comes up to my hand. This is a loop. Here is the spoke. 
the speed at which I am spinning this rope creates the, the center fleeing force. And the main centripetal force or center seeking force is provided by the spoke that I'm hanging on to with my hand. So we've got our loop here spinning in a circle. We're pu pulling it in a circle with our roping hand by the spoke. The spoke provides the centripetal forces. The speed that we're spinning and the mass of the rope itself combine to create the centrifugal force. But there's one kicker with our trick rope. That's right here. Our string here, or our spoke, is not connected solidly with the, with the loop. It's connected with a sliding Honda. With our swinging horseshoe, the string, which provides our centripetal force, is tied solidly to the horseshoe. It's solid. It's always going to be there, no matter how fast I swing this and increase the centrifugal force this string will pull back with the same amount of force and uh, the system will say stay static because they balance each other out. Here, our spoke is not attached to the loop. It will chain. So what does that mean? It means that our centripetal force is provided by the spoke and provided by the friction here between the, the spoke and the Honda. And as you spin it fast, a, a little angle is, is created. That angle helps with the friction to provide the centripetal force. But even more than that, the side of this loop is controlled by a balance between the centrifugal force of the loop trying to expand because we're spinning it fast enough it wants to expand. And this Honda here, this Honda all by itself, that little piece of rope right there, has mass. This little piece of rope here has more weight than this little piece of rope here because there's two pieces of rope. That Honda also wants to flee the center. Centrifugal force is acting on that Honda. If this loop wants to expand, it has to push the Honda towards the center. But the Honda doesn't want to go towards the center. It wants to expand too. For it to expand and flee the center, it has to make the loop smaller. So if you construct your rope, so the, the tricks you're doing, the, the forces wanting to expand the loop are equal to the forces wanting to push that Honda out away from your body, then your loop stays stable. It stays the same size. Here on Earth, we have one more force that's affecting our rope, especially when it's a, uh, a flat loop, and that's gravity. So now centrifugal force is uh, trying to expand that loop, Centrifugal force is always act, also acting on the Honda. They balanced each other out. So this loop is staying the same size and the spoke is staying the same length. Now if I slow this rope down, gravity starts to pull on the whole thing. Gravity is pulling the Honda down, also causing the rope to sag. The loop is getting smaller and the spoke is getting longer because gravity is pulling that Honda down, making the spoke longer. Got our circle now, if I speed that up, centrifugal force acts on that, uh, on that loop, causing it to expand. It's pushing the Honda up. I, I let some rope out to uh, to compensate for that. So my spoke got short and my loop got bigger. I said we could increase the centrifugal force by increasing speed 
or by increasing mass. Given the speed, I was spinning this loop. The centrifugal force created by the, the mass in the loop itself was greater than the centrifugal force created by the mass in the Honda. So the Honda got overpowered, the Honda slipped up. The Honda was pushed up by this loop expanding. The Honda got pushed up towards my hand. The spoke got shorter. The loop got bigger. We ask ourselves if there's anything we can do to alter these dynamics. And of course there is. The rope I'm using today is a uh, brand new uh, cotton spot cord or a cotton red spot. Uh, it's the kind of rope that Will Rogers used. Uh, you can buy it at Western Stage Props in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's the only place to buy it, actually. Uh, and when you buy it, you'll end up with a Honda just like this. <laughs> the rope is folded over to make a, a small loop, and then it's taped. Now, there's not much mass in that Honda. It's just a little bit of tape and, and a folded over rope. There is some mass, there is some weight there, but not much. There's no burner on the Honda. There's some friction there, but not much. It's pretty slick. As you saw, this rope will do a uh, medium or small small sized uh, flat loop just fine it'll manage a small butterfly sort of but not very well and the reason is a vertical loop in a butterfly is a fast spinning loop and as you know you pick up the speed you pick up the centrifugal force and the centrifugal force on that much rope overpowers the centrifugal force of a, uh, of a Honda with very little weight. The question is, what can you do to change the dynamics? Uh, what I do is I change the weight of my Honda. This is the easiest Honda to make. Just folded the, uh, Folding that uh, rope over to make a loop and then taping it. Now, if you find that's too light, and I think it's almost always too light, uh, you can tape a, uh, a dime inside there. And you'd be amazed at how much difference just a dime will make. Or you could put a nickel in there, maybe a quarter. Now, I've tried this and it does work. I don't, that's not what I use, but, but it, it does work. What I do with all my ropes is I put a leather burner on them. Now, if there's no leather burner, after a while, this rope moving through that Honda will wear out the inside of your Honda. If you put a leather burner on there, that leather lasts for a long time. Even if you use rough leather, it will smooth out and uh, you'll be able to change the size of your loop. It'll slide through there real nice. But if something wears out, it will be the leather. And this, this Honda has been replaced uh, several times over the years. It's a pretty old rope, really. Uh, so just that leather burner adds weight and mass. I tie it, instead of with tape, I do it with wire. And uh, wire adds mass. You'll be amazed at uh, how much change just a couple wraps of, of that 17 gauge wire will make. It's a, it's a very light, you can see it's a very light wire, but just a couple right, wraps makes a big difference in the mass. This is uh, my version of a long rope. It's a big loop rope. It's only 45 feet long, but it's big enough to go around my horse. And I use it to throw half inches on kids. A lot of people will use a brass Honda or metal Honda for their, their big loop tricks. But since, since I'm throwing this at kids a lot, I don't want to hit a kid in the face with a, uh, with a brass Honda. That wire never seems to hit him, but this part will hit him, and, and I'd rather hit him with that leather than, than a, a brass weight. But it's a big loop. 
when I get that loop spun out around my horse, the mass of the loop is increased by all those coils. So I need a heavy Honda to balance that out. I speed it up, make that big, make it big, make it big, then we get the size I want, I slow it down and it's stuck. Because I have a heavy Honda. The Honda burner itself is not heavy, but all that wire on there adds to the mass and lets me spin a big flat loop. Here's a classic brass Honda most, most people use for their big loops. They use that brass Honda because it's heavy. And that, uh, that heavy brass Honda will balance out all those ropes in the big loop. I've got other purposes for my big loop, so I don't use it. But, but you also need a brass Honda with all that weight for your Texas skip. Now my big loop is 45 feet approximately. This one is almost 24 feet long. I like lots of space in my loop as I'm going through it. It's a vertical loop, so it's fast and it needs, uh, needs lots of weight. So I've got a heavy brass Honda on there and quite a lot of wire for more weight. My uh, Texas skip rope may have needed more weight than other people's Texas skip rope because it might be a little longer. Plus, you see the difference in that rope and this new one, those pretty red spots on that one. All my ropes are kind of gray. They've been used many years <laughs> and painted. This one's been painted several times. It's got several coats of paint and those coats of paint add mass. And consequently, I had to add weight to my Honda. Now, I don't know if you can see there, I had to experiment. You know, I guessed, I guessed at the amount of wire I needed put a bunch of wire on there and you can see a few splices in there where I added more. I just kept adding more until I could spin that loop. And once it uh, spun out to full size, I could slow it down a little bit and it would balance. Now, when you're spinning your, like your Texas, any of these loops, any of these loops you're spinning, as you're spinning them, you can feel whether your Honda is slipping, you feel a little vibration in your rope. You can feel it and you can hear it. So you know that your loop is stable or not. You know, it's, it's easier when you're doing a wedding ring or a flat loop, but when you're doing the Texas skip, you know, that rope is going fast. It's going fast and you can feel that, that Honda is sliding all over the place. If it's sliding all over the place, you have to ask why. Either you're not making a perfect circle with your hand or your Honda is not weighted properly. This is a picture of me doing the Texas skip with that rope I just showed you. You can see it's a fairly big loop. And here's the angle. Here's the angle I was talking about. The rope comes from my hand down that spoke, goes through the uh, Honda and then makes a right angle. Now just that angle there will kind of capture that uh, Honda and keep it in place. But if your uh, spoke is not weighted properly, it'll be sliding up here and it'll slide down here. It'll, with every turn of the loop, it'll slide a little bit. And then you have to examine the size circle you're making with your hand or the weight of your Honda. This Honda is balanced pretty well. I'm just getting my Texas skip going here. We're gonna keep playing that rope out. Right there, it stabilizes, doesn't get any bigger. This is that longer horse loop I showed you. That Honda is just light enough to start it with a, a small butterfly, but ideally, your butterfly should be, you know, your vertical loop should be bigger with this rope to start it. But I'm spinning it pretty fast there. Pretty fast trying to get that centrifugal force to make the loop grow. Make it grow, make it grow. Bring it down into a flat loop. Now I'm going to slow that loop down. And you see how gravity takes that 
takes that Honda back down towards the towards the ground, makes that loop small. Here I'm starting a wedding ring with that longer rope. Right there, I've I've slowed the spin down so it's not growing anymore. It's stabilized. Now we're going to pick up the speed, increase the centrifugal force. That loop is forcing the Honda up and I'm letting rope out to compensate. So I'm keeping the spoke the same length by letting rope out. And the loop is forcing that, that Honda up because its centrifugal force is greater than the centrifugal force on the Honda. Spinning it out, spinning it out. I'm gonna stop it right there. I slowed down a little bit and now the rope is uh, stable. So there you go. The science in the art of trick roping. If you're trying to trick, you're spinning over and over again, you just can't seem to control control your loop like you think you should. Maybe it's not you. Maybe it's time to experiment with the mass or the weight of your Honda. Good luck. If you have any problems, let me know. See you next time.